surface water issues in Lake County. And because the tribe I work for is uh, right on the shores of Clear Lake, a lot of the work that we do is, um, is uh, Clear Lake watershed related. The, the lake is the largest natural lake in California, so it's really important for us to have a, a strong program about water quality and uh, to pay attention to the trends. So I, I'm going to, I have a, a, a presentation I'll be pulling from about our cyanotoxin monitoring program, and I'll go into that a little bit. But I also want to talk about just surface water in general. I want to talk a little bit about groundwater, uh, because I know this, this group is particularly groundwater focused, and it's one of my weaker areas. So, um, but I'm on a couple of advisory groups having to do with the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. So I would like to uh, bring up a few things that might be good tools for everybody, or maybe people already know it. I know Elizabeth is very, very, has done a ton of research on the vineyards mm -hmm. and the, the work that's, the, the things that are happening around here. So she might be further along than I am on, on various things. But I, I do want to talk about those tools and <coughs> that, that are out there. And uh, also the Valley Fire with the, um, with the uh, catastrophic fires that happened last uh, summer, uh, the tribe took a, a, a strong role in doing watershed monitoring. Turns out after large fires, there's no protocol and there's no plan to do watershed monitoring after the fires. We discovered that. Um, and so it was a hard sell to the different agencies to cover the cost of the lab analysis uh, for uh, water sampling. Because we were concerned, you know, there's a lot of plastics that burn, there was a lot of um, metals that burned, um, a lot of sediment loading. We're already a lake that has um, problems. Um, it's a lake that's used for drinking water, for swimming, for ceremonial uses, there's fish spawning, there's endangered species here. The water quality needs to be good. And, and there was no plan to do water monitoring. So, we uh, were able to do a monitoring plan and, and got it, um, uh, we're able to convince the Central Valley Regional Water Quality Control Board to pay for the analysis. So we're several, uh, three, uh, several samples into, sampling events into water sampling for Cooter Creek and St. Helena Creek, uh, but also Kelsey Creek, which was burned um, at the top, and uh, Control Creek, Forbes Creek, and Lankport. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and pesticides. Uh, I know that's been going around in, in our email list, and I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the pesticide monitoring program we have at Big Valley. Um, the importance of sampling. I know someone was asking about, well, how do you uh, sample for glyphosate, or what, what's, what's that about? It's really important with activism work, in my opinion, that you get it right, you get the pronunciation right, you, you, you don't you know, use a mayonnaise jar, and, leave it in your fridge for two weeks and you know, I mean, there's just like real specific things and I want to go over this today. And we actually, um, when, when you do environmental monitoring, let me just throw this out there before I forget, there, it's worth going after a Rose Foundation grant, okay? It's 5,000, you can go after a Rose Foundation grant, there's like a grassroots grant, 5,000 bucks. We got it for KPFC, I, was, I had a radio show called Water Hour for about a year, year and a half, and was talking about these various things. And we had $5,000 to buy water sampling kits and to do outreach to the community and, you know, um, <clears throat> collect data, that type of thing. So, you know, it's worth going after with a group, going after some of these grassroots grants that are not that complicated to right or manage and I'm happy to help with that um, and then it's really important to document your data and you know when you do environmental monitoring I'm going to pass this around don't remove anything from it but I'm going to pass it around you need to track your stuff so like I said you don't use a mayonnaise jar just throw it in you know you, you use the right bottles that have the right preservative and I'll show you that on a local lab a UKI lab you, it's not that hard it's really not that hard so um, I want to, um, you know, just provide that sort of information because that is, provides better information, better environmental monitoring data, and, you know, my background's in government. I have a degree in government. So, you know, you throw yourself into these things and learn them, and then you can do them. And, and so, like I said, I've been doing it for 15 years at Big Valley, um, and we've been pretty successful in getting some things changed. So. 
So knowledge is power. Uh, so when you have pollutants, um, you end up with really serious water quality pro problems. And uh, probably all of you have heard of blue-green algae or cyanobacteria. Same thing, blue-green algae is kind of less technical name of it because it's not actually an algae, it's a bacteria. <clears throat> it's a natural uh, bacteria. It actually produces oxygen that we need in our atmosphere. It's been found in sediment cores of the lake. You know, it's been around. But cyanobacteria blooms produce toxins that can kill dogs. They've been, it's been killing dogs in the Russian River. We had a dog death on Clear Lake in 2013. And um, I wanted to highlight in this presentation that I normally give with Corolla Kennedy, who's the environmental director of Elam Indian College, some of the things about cyanobacteria. And uh, those of you who are in different watersheds, like right now we're in the Poudre Creek watershed, which is the middle, middle town area, it's in the Poudre Creek watershed. Clear Lake is in the upper Cache Creek watershed. Um, those, you know, knowing what watershed you're in is really important <coughs> because the agencies fund things by watershed. The Department of Water Resources looks at integrated regional watershed management plans. These things are not hard to get a handle on. You just have to, you have to find a starting point and then just go into it. it. The great thing about working together as a group is that we all have our interests and specialties and and um, things that can stick in our brains better. Like, don't ask me to, you know, there's just a, t a million topics that I, I can't get. But um, the ones I can get, um, I, get. So, and that's how it is with everybody. So the more we work together, the better. Um, so let me go into cyanotoxin uh, a little bit. Can anyone see? Am I sitting kind of right in front of this stuff? I can see this oh, finger. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that weird stuff on top of the lake is a cyanobacteria bloom that has toxins in it. Um, and the toxins can be liver toxins, um, skin toxins, dermatoxins, and neurotoxins. And the, it's the neurotoxins that kill, that have been killing the dogs. Um, right now there's no water quality standards. There's no requirements of having to meet a certain level because uh, for cyanotoxins. It's been on a, um, a list of concern with US EPA for more than 10 years. And it wasn't until the Lake Erie, uh, the Toledo, Ohio uh, drinking water fiasco that happened a couple years ago where tens of thousands of people had their water shut off because there was toxins in their drinking water. Uh, it wasn't until that happened that it elevated cyanotoxins to a higher level within US EPA and the federal agencies. And because of that, they're now on the pathway <coughs> to develop standards for recreation and drinking water. Last year, around June, US EPA uh, provided a, a health advisory guideline for the water purveyors to meet a certain level and to do a certain amount of monitoring uh, for the drinking water. So in Lake County, there are 17 water purveyors that take their water from Clear Lake, treat it, and serve it to 45,000 people in this county. That's more than half the people in this county are drinking Clear Lake water. I personally. Stay away from Clear Lake water. So if I'm, I can say it, it's on video, but if I'm in Clear Lake or Lake Port in the summertime, I don't drink their water. I just don't. I don't drink their lemonade, I don't drink their coffee, I don't drink any of that because I know that the water purveyors are challenged with taking the toxins out of the lake. Because <coughs> our program monitors for toxins, I know what those levels are. I'm not drinking that water in the summertime. Um, I'll skip. Uh, we, tribes, working for a tribe, we have grants, we have uh, our own funding, we have to write our own grants. I just finished two grant submittals yesterday. Um, but uh, our environmental programs are to protect the resources and protect the, uh, in this case for, for Big Valley, it's protecting the water quality and protecting the, the animals and plants of, that, that live in that water, which includes an endangered but uh, the fish that's on the California Endangered Species List uh, called the Clear Lake Hitch. So, uh, and it's so that there will be food and animals and, and water quality to, to continue to practice their culture. It's not okay to have things destroyed because of vineyards or uh, development because people want to have their nice dock. I mean, we all do it. We're all part of the problem. We need to be conscious and part of the solution. Um, one thing I have to say about this group is I know there's a, a, um, 
a discussion about returning to the old, old small town. Da, da, da. Small town has already gone a little bit too far. Okay, small town led us to these other problems because small town decided that there wasn't an environmental review needed for agricultural operations. So all the benefits that everybody's been getting, having their vineyards and having these small town things, you led to the problems that we have now, which is the big stuff, also doesn't have environmental reviews. So we let that happen. And it, returning to environmental, strict environmental reviews of the impacts of uh, agriculture would benefit all of us tremendously in the long run because there is pollution that comes from vineyards as well as all development, as well as all human activities, and we have to, there are solutions to it. But we have to be honest about the impacts as well. And that happens from small vineyards as well as large ones. <clears throat> so just briefly, cyanobacteria and cyanotoxins, the bacteria is the microorganism, it's the bacteria. It, it goes through photosynthesis, I mean, it uses photosynthesis for energy, so that's why it's, it's called blue-green algae, because it acts like an algae in that way. But it's actually, it is not an algae. Uh, it, is, um, it also has uh, pigments in it that are um, specific just to it, uh, that we're, gonna, we're monitoring already this year. Uh, with an algae, it has chlorophyll A, which is an algae, and also has phycocyanin, which is only in cyanobacteria. But the bacteria can produce toxins, and I have a, a table in, in this presentation of the different toxins they produce. Some of them can be harmful to your health, some of them just will affect your skin. Um, and, the, and we look under a microscope to see what's in the water samples so that we, we know which uh, toxins to send off for analysis or in the labs. Um, you can come into contact with cyanotoxins from swimming, um, drinking the water, having aerosol spray from, um, what do you call them, you know, just the, the different um, sea dews and other things that people are using, jet skis. And animals will eat the cyanobacteria mats. Cows do it. There are cows that roam Clear Lake. <laughs> uh, and, and dogs, and they both really like the cyanobacteria mats. Um, we did create a cyanobacteria task force, which is made up of a, a Clear Lake cyanobacteria task force once we started getting really high results uh, with our sampling. And it's made up of state and federal agencies. The county is <clears throat> somewhat involved. Um, I do think for those of you who live out of the county, it, it's worth paying attention to the water quality that's happening there. That is one of the ways that you can back up into, okay, these large vineyards are not doing what they're supposed to do. So having that handle on the impacts of it uh, is, is, is really important. Because if it creates a condition like we have in Clear Lake, you can start to, you can start to say, okay, these policies, these management policies are not strong enough to protect the water. So um, this is, th these are, uh, we, we have tw 21 monitoring locations, and this is clear like right there. So we, we have uh, sites, uh, this, our cyanotoxin monitoring program that Big Valley and Elam has, has 21 sites around the lake. So as you can see, we try to get um, as many parts as we can. Uh, there's some spaces between uh, Lucerne and Clear Lake Oaks, and that's because there's no pr public um, access. Yeah, which is kind of interesting for a public lake. But we do have, this is called the, the upper arm, the oaks arm, and the lower arm. The lower arm is what has, what, what uh, drains to clear, uh, Cash Creek. So this tends to be the worst in that, you know, it's, it just drains, so things sort of settle there. There are currents that happen water currents, and you see um, some interesting stuff happening in terms of the water quality, uh, but ultimately things tend to focus, settle down here. In the upper part of the lake, it, what they call, I don't know, I guess the North Shore, the, the biggest sediment load is happening, uh, sediment loading is happening in Middle Creek. Middle Creek, what's happening on the land up there is that there's a, the Forest Service is up there and they allow the ATV vehicles and they get money for operating by selling permits to the ATV riders, and and then they're loading sediment into the creek, and when it rains, it goes into here. I just can't believe it's still allowed. I know everybody likes their recreation, but I can't believe that so much sediment is coming in, like 70% of the sediment load for Clear Lake is coming in through here. Sediment is what feeds cyanobacteria. 
because of the pollutants and the nutrients that are in it. So it's it's um, you know it's important to get a handle on our policies and um, so that's one policy that I think has got to change and something that we're working on. So um, this is just a, just jumping a little bit. This is a chart of the different cyanobacteria that are in Clear Lake. So we will look under the microscope for it's a it's a list, but we will look under the microscope for these and there's some repeats in here because this, these are the toxins that they produce and the type of toxins. So microcystin is the one that's in the lake the most, and it's a hepatotoxin, which means it affects your liver. Uh, the dog that died in Clear Lake had a hepatotoxin, um, hepatotoxins in its liver when they did the autopsy. The um, anatoxins is what the Russian River is dealing with right now, and the dog deaths, they're finding the anatoxins, that's a neurotoxin. The dogs started having, the dogs were having seizures and died very quickly. As a matter of fact, I think they call anatoxin very quick death in the agencies. There's not been, in, as far as I know, um, the, the, the human deaths that have occurred have been linked to dialysis centers in other countries. Because dialysis, well, there's a dialysis in a center in Clear Lake, and there's a dialysis center in Lake where both of those get their water from Clear Lake, the lake, and they do have to take special precautions, and they're doing lots of uh, monitoring on it, which is great because they need to, especially in the summertime. Um, there are other, uh, our, our program, basically what we do is, is we, we pull out water samples, we look under the microscope to see what kind of cyanobacteria it is. If we see enough of them, we'll go ahead and send off to the lab for analysis of these toxins, and we get our results within five to seven days. There's um, anabina, it's a neurotoxin, it produces neurotoxins, it's not a neurotoxin. Microcystis. Uh, is what we have most in the lake. Um, Leotrichia, Olympia. Olympia is what was happening in 2009. Uh, there was a predominance of that. Um, the state is finally waking up as a sleeping giant that it is. And um, back, actually in 2010, it decided that if there were levels, uh, uh, um, lab results that showed certain levels, that there should be certain signs. Now, Basically, in Lake County and in Clear Lake, nobody was monitoring the water for it because it's not required. So because it's not required, nobody's monitoring for it. In 2014, the tribe said, we are tired of nobody monitoring for it. We need to monitor for it because we're afraid of those blooms. They're to they can be toxic. There's no information, so let's just go ahead and do it. Uh, so we, we uh, got a federally approved quality assurance plan to do the monitoring. Um, and, and basically what that does is it, it creates, you, you pick sites based on, you know, it has to be a rationale between, a, a, a rationale behind your monitoring plan. You don't just willy-nilly, you know, it has to make sense. Um, and then what are you going to do with the results? What are the standard operating procedures that you're going to use when you take samples? So that's not willy-nilly, you always going to put gloves on, you don't stick your fingers in the bottles, you use the right kinds of bottles and have the right kinds of um, preservatives and you keep it cool and you send it out to the lab and these are the procedures of the lab. It's just, you know, it's not complicated, but um, it's important to do. So our federally approved QAP uh, uh, for, for the Big Valley and for ELAM was, uh, we had a section just on cyanotoxin monitoring and uh, that started in 2014. So we've been doing lake monitoring of cyanotoxins since 2014. You saw a map earlier of the sites around the lake. So this is the state's decision. Uh, this is the most recent one in, uh, in, in 2016 to say, okay, this is where we think we need to have caution signs. Is, is this blurry? Is it blurry? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Caution. Caution. Yeah, okay, it's good. Warning and danger. So danger signs at 20 micrograms per liter. Another word for that is parts per billion. Um, uh, parts per billion. When you think, see uh, parts per million, that's micrograms per liter, or mg slash l. So microcystins is the one we are primarily focused on because that's really what we have in the lake. So just remember those numbers. Caution signs at 0 0.8. Uh, danger signs at 20 parts per billion. And that's basically to warn people to uh, who are using the lake in areas where the lab results are coming back high. So um, we did, this is a chart of our results. Um, we did compare the number of sampling times to the number of times that it exceeded that 0 0.8, just to kind of show this is how often a, 
caution sign needs to go up. But um, so there are some sites that were, you know, there should have been signs up 70% of the time, 90% of the time, 92% of the time. So we looked at it for 2014 and 2015. Um, some of them it says not sampled because of the uh, because we added those sites in 2015. Let me just point out in 2015 it was a lot better because the fires happened and the cyanobacteria blooms disappeared after the fires started. So that was interesting. You know, I have some information about that. But let me point out in uh, the highest level recorded sign. So Lake Port by First Street ramp at 877, remember 0 0.8 is where they say it should be a caution sign. And that's because and that is based on a child, like an eight to ten year old child swimming in the water for five hours and the amount of water that they swallow. So that and the, those levels were set by the Cal EPA's Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, OEHA is what they're called. Yes. Where did the signs go up? And you see a decrease in recreation when you do it. They're not going up. Oh, they're not. No, Cal is not putting them up. Isn't it continuing that bad? We're trying. Okay. Yes. And, and then the trying is to get the word out to people so there's an outrage. If you put signs up, they put them down, that would be uh, so you get charged with a crime or something. Well, the, the signs are. You know, should be put up by by the the water managers. Um, so hopefully the public wouldn't be taking them down. The county did put up signs a few years ago that said, "If you see a bloom, stay out of it." But I have a few pictures in my in my presentation about um, areas that look clear that had toxin levels. So because of our monitoring program, we're we're there every other week at these same sites and, and taking pictures and doing sampling. So knowledge is power. We have information. We can show you that there's uh, toxins right here and it doesn't look like a bloom. So the advice to stay out of there if there's a bloom is not quite right. Um, if there's been a bloom in there in the last few weeks, maybe stay out of it for a little bit longer. Um, so 877, there was a 16,920 back in 2014. That was by, um, sorry, that was Clear Lake Oaks, about 100 feet from a in water intake. So uh, 5,000 at Sulphur Bay Mercury Mine. In 2015, the highest, oh, it's not showing on this, was Austin Park, that was 10,162. I have to say about Austin Park, and it's at the very bottom, it's hard to see. It is the, it's a, it's a recreation beach in the city of Clear Lake, and it should have signs on it. I think there's a small eight, uh, eight and a half by eleven piece of paper that's been like taped on it that is from two years ago that they never took down. Um, but uh, it does say, uh, you know, um, something about uh, blue green algae toxins. But it's in one place and it's old and 92% um, of the time it, it exceeded in 2014 it exceeded the 0.8 parts per billion. So basically, it really should have been a sign. In 2015, even 56% of the time it exceeded, and this is a high recreation beach. Uh, last year, it did have the highest uh, cyanotoxin levels at over 10,000. Uh, what uh, department in the county would be responsible for putting up those signs? It would either well, it would it would either be the public health department, the environmental health department, or water resources. Environmental health department um, is is least likely. Public health is most likely. Um, from what I understand, there are people at the top of the county um, hierarchy that don't like the idea of the signs because of uh, fear of tourism. So, so a little bit more. One of the things that the state is recommending is uh, there's some issues with fish and shellfish where you have cyanotoxin levels and Fish, you can go ahead and at low levels, you can go ahead and throw away the guts and clean, clean the fillets with tap water or well water or bottled water, but you should not eat shellfish from these waters. There are native peoples that are eating shellfish from the lake, and we've submitted uh, grant proposals. It looks like we're going to get them to do shellfish testing and fish testing of Clear Lake for cyanotoxins. And I know I'm focusing a lot on, talk on cyanotoxins, but um, let's see. Well, the sites, I'm sorry. Yeah, will they be provided in Spanish? 
Is, has that been discussed? I don't, you know, the, the best um, place to do comments is um, with the California cyanotoxin, <clears throat> wait, California cyanobacteria harmful algal bloom networks. It's called, if you can Google this, write, up, write it down, CCHAB network. CCHAB for California cyanobacteria harmful algal bloom network. And it's part of the State Water Resources Control Board, which is part of Cal EPA. And they are taking comments on their signs. Their signs, it was their signs that are in here. Um, the sign recommendations have existed since 2010 in California. Has anybody seen signs? Uh, yeah. I mean, they're not up because the agencies don't even want I remember seeing the signs we were talking about it, uh, at the beach. At, at Austin Park. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's an old, that's an old sign, um, especially with your dogs. You don't, you know, I've seen dogs come out of the lake green, and it's really worrisome. Um, so CC Hab Network, if you if you get into their system, um, you'll see the stuff that they're working on. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you give me your email, I'll forward you the. Uh, there is a webinar that's happening about the signage in the next in, on like May 29th. I got it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm signed up. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Okay. So I would I would um, get in through them to make comments. Because Spanish, I don't I haven't heard about that, whether they're gonna put it in. Um, just a couple pictures of blooms and toxin levels um, for uh, our monitoring program. So obviously you see a bloom and there's toxins. That's uh, Austin Park right there. You can see Corolla's root disappears just a few inches under the water. And the right-hand picture is when the cyanotoxin level is at 10, over 10,000. Um, here is uh, evidence of bloom, but there's no detect on the toxin, so you can see a bloom, and there might be a no detect on, on the toxin so, um, that we sent off for. Here's a bloom with low toxin levels at 4.6. We call 4.6 low, but it's still well over 0.8. Right? Um, Another bloom, but low toxin levels. Here's a bloom, but there is, here's no bloom, but there is toxin levels. This had 5.6 uh, parts per billion for microcystin. And then you can see the bottom of the lake, it's pretty clear. So what's happening is, um, is just that, you know, there are currents. What, the cyanobacteria is like, well, just imagine a water balloon and inside are the, are the toxins. And when the balloon is burst, then the toxins go out. So if you have, um, when they're dying or when they're agitated to the point where they actually break open is where the toxins go. What the water purveyors are doing are trying to filter out the, the, the actual uh, bloom rather than chlorinate it and break it, because chlorine does not kill the toxins. Chlorine kills the cyanobacteria, then you've got the toxins through your water system. So they're trying to filter that out and they're working really hard to do that filter out the bloom in the early stages of the treatment process so that you don't have to deal with a toxin throughout. But if there, if you already have a toxin because some of them have already died and it gets into your water system, then, then, they have, then there are type of carbon, not the carbon we can buy on our own filters, mind you, but granulated activated carbon is one of the biggest treatment, uh, successful treatment ways to get uh, cyanotoxins out of your drinking water system for a treatment plant. So, um, it is uh, something that works, but they can only work so much, and so when you have really high levels of toxin, can your water purveyors handle those toxin levels in terms of their existing treatment? The state says no, they can only uh, handle up to an order of magnitude of two, which means if it's, you know, if you're looking at 10,000, it's gonna carry it down to, you know, 100, so, um, and 100 is well over. What the state, the feds recommend um, a 0.3 parts per billion, for uh, cyan for microcystin in drinking water. So that basically means if you have over 30 parts per billion of microcystin in their intake in the in the uh, treatment plant, it's not going to be able to get it down to 0.3. Right. If I have a cup of coffee at the uh, uh, at a coffee shop in Clear Lake, the Catfish Coffee House, and it, that water came from the lake. Well, the fact that it's boiled water, will that kill the poison? No. No. It may kill the, the, ba the bacteria, but it's released the poison, so the poison is... Well, the, the bacteria would have been um, destroyed much earlier in the treatment process, because they have filtration, they have okay. chlorination. 
chlorination kills the, you know, chlorination busts the balloon, then you got all the water in the balloon to deal with. So you've got the balloon is destroyed somewhere in the treatment process, but the toxins have to be filtered out. So what might be in that coffee that would be bad for me other than the coffee itself? <laughs> Um, I thought you drank smoothies a lot, Greg. I do. I, I do. <laughs> I but I can't, occasionally I I've like seen it. his big old charts. I, I, I help out the economy. Okay. <laughs> now, um, I would, you know, if this is what I would do, rule of thumb that I do, is if it smells like algae in Clear Lake that day or, oh. you know, that week, I just don't drink the water. Just don't drink the because e even the coffee, even the hot. No, coffee. I mean it's all coming out. I mean if you want to, if you want to, and uh, oh, sorry, it's being filmed. Thanks, Maurice. But um, if you want to uh, be safe, I would just not because the water purveyors are not testing for the toxin. No, can not I, required to. Right. Can I ask what the what the nature of the toxin is? Is it a protein? Is it a polysaccharide or? Ooh, that's beyond what I know. Um, I can I can send some stuff to yeah. you, but that would be important because because proteins denature when they are when they boil. These don't. The boiling is not a way to destroy okay. this. So then, the, then it can't be a protein. And it yeah. must be some polysaccharide or whatever. It what? must be a sugar or something that doesn't that doesn't denature when you boil. Yeah. Do they survive the human digestive system? <clears throat> and my next question would be, is there any wastewater being discharged into the Into the Yeah. Um, the, so the, it's not about the toxins survive. You know, toxins, it, toxins break down, I guess, over time. Okay. So because at our monitoring, we're seeing toxins, and then the next week we're not seeing toxins. It, even in water purveyors, if they see toxins, the next week they don't see toxins. So they, they are breaking down in some way. So it's not about surviving the track. It's the cyanobacteria that you want to, you know, that you wouldn't be drinking cyanobacteria blooms because that would just be horrible. You'd be drinking, you know, what look like algae um, globules, you know. So so th those would be the ones that would break down because of your because of your acid, you know, and then you'd have the toxins. But all drinking water treatment systems, public water systems, filter and treat, so you would just be left with the toxins. Um, no, the toxins. If you're drinking to waters with toxins, it builds up in your. If it's a hepatotoxin, it builds up in your liver. If it's a neurotoxin, then it attacks your nervous system. So it has an it has an effect on people. What the state also looks at is chronic and acute um, uh, exposure. So chronic exposure is a long-term exposure because of people either drinking the water or a long time swimming in the water. And those levels, you know, they set those levels of exposure. I mean, there are pollutants all over and contaminants in our world. We live in a fishbowl, basically, for, you know, billions of people in many years. So we have a lot of stuff out there to clean. Um, but you will, uh, if you're drinking it, it's, it's a, there's a potential that, depending on what type of toxin it is, it's going to be building up on your organs or affecting you. And you know, are the, you know, okay. the, the liver, um, stats on liver disease higher? In Lake County? And it actually it is. If you go to, so I highly recommend looking at the site, Google um, incidences of cancer by county and you will get to some cdc site and you can you can get in there and look at the county and then you can look at it by race age sex and it turns out that lake county is in the top five of incidences of liver cancer in the state of california um, but if you filter it and, and you can see that that's primarily because of white men over 50. So they've got the highest rate. So I know I was looking at that going, hmm. But white men over 50 are, I don't think, are the predominant people who live around the lake, uh, drinking lake water. I think it, the, what the you know state says is it's, it's lifestyle issues. So. I would agree with that. I think the I think the your highest risk for developing liver cancer is not your lake toxins, but uh, alcohol. And, um, and that is, uh, right. that's a known carcinogen and it will give you liver cancer. And right. a white male over 50 fits very well with the demographic of someone who would have liver cancer. That's what I'm know. saying, yeah. I mean, that's, so it is interesting to unpack that data to see what aces and rage, um, races and ages and sexes are 
getting or having these problems. But uh, initially, though, I thought, hmm, that's interesting that we're in the top five incidences of liver cancer. And we also have more than half the population drinking water that potentially has some hepatitis in it. I think it's probably But it's, well, that's what the state says. We yeah. also are in the top five of respiratory cancers, but we have the cleanest air in the state. So, you know, so yeah, the state says, yeah, it's, it's um, what do you call it, lifestyle choices, worries. Uh, no one ever hardly mentions anything about the non-protein amino acid, which is um, which is a uh, toxin, neurotoxin, that almost all the cyanobacteria, as well as others, I think, emits. And this is it accumulates in the brain, and it's a neurotoxin that has been responsible for a series like ALS and, and these kinds of things. You're talking about BMAA? Yeah, BMAA. So there, there have already been some studies on fish and fish uh, BMAA levels in fish. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's, I don't, from what I understand, it's not a, BMAA neurotoxin is not, there's not the, the strongest link yet to that in some of these diseases. The thing is, it gets, it. it gets like all the water, I mean, the water goes to yellow for uh, uh, vegetation and, and vegetables and stuff. The thing is, it, it's, it, it isn't uh, killed by boiling and, uh, or done away with by boiling, and it's accumulative in the plants. It takes uptake through the roots and into the plants itself. This is how it was first researched, actually. And so that uptake is very likely, could be, even in the grapes, but it's uh, because it's not just a water-based. So this is never, this is a serious thing, but it's never mentioned because it probably is a little serious and it's in its initial stages of research but it's been researched for at least 10 years or 20 years even in the original research. Well, but directly related to cyanobacteria toxins. Well, it is a cyanotoxin. Um, but, but it's an amino acid, well, it's a different animal. Whether it, whether it is uptake into plants, I think, I mean, they're, they're also looking at that with cyanotoxins, uh, with the other cyanotoxins. Uh, I'm gonna get out of this presentation and go to the next thing. Um, but uh, the, yeah, it's, it's, it is good to do your research and, and to see the linkages of things. Um, okay, so that's a little bit about kind of what happens with pollution um, in terms of our water quality. The next thing I want to talk about is... I have one more question. Yes. Um, there was a, a couple of years back, there was a Japanese company who proposed to clear up the lake for free. Um, because they developed a technology that's much like a floating um, water treatment plant. And the reason they were interested in doing that is because the biomass that they would harvest from the lake, they would use to make diesel fuel out of biodiesel. Um, and, and the county turned that down, do you, their proposal. Do you know anything about that? That's before my time that I was here. Um, uh, I think it happened in the 90s or something. I hear that um, a lot and people have read that somewhere. Um, what the county says is that they came out, they took a look, and the, the, um, the algae that they found in the lake was not what they needed okay. for, um, to, to do biofuel. Thank you. Um, so that's their, you know, it's hard to find any other information, but that is, that is what, um, the county, county staff say there is um, cyanobacteria masses. I mean, if you if you're pulling them out, you need to think about toxins in them too, because of the uh, because even in moist mats, there's there's still some toxins, and there's not enough there's not been enough research about how um, how long you have to you know how long is this a problem? There's a whole lot of things that are that we're not at yet in terms of cyanobacteria. Um, one of the water purveyors is constantly filtering their cyanobacteria mats and just dumping them near, you know, on their land. And there's no regulations about that yet. But the more that we find out about the toxin levels and, and the, there's a lot of research going on, um, the, the better. Uh, also, I just want to say, you know, some people take algae supplements, right? I mean, I took algae supplements in the 90s too. And, and those, uh, the type of, uh, so Celtech was the name of the company that I remember in the 90s, but um, there is, they were, they were getting um, 
a femizominum floss aqua, AFA, was the, was, the, was the algae that they were selling. Well, that is a cyanobacteria. And what Celltech, the company, said was, we are testing the toxin levels on a regular basis, and we just have to go below a certain level. And they were testing it all the time. So I don't know, uh, you know about these supplements, but it is a cyanobacteria and, a cyano, and potentially cyanotoxins in them. You know, it's not something that I would necessarily fool with anymore. I wouldn't fool with it anymore. Um, the Valley, the Valley Fire. So the Valley Fire burned, um, boy, do I know how many acres? How many acres did it burn? Seven, well, we had three seven, fires. Eight. I think all together it was almost over 150,000. But all together because there were three. Right. There was the other day. I think it was almost 170,000 actually. The Valley, the Rocky. So it was almost 70,000. For the Valley Fire. Yes. Just yeah. the Valley Fire, yeah. But then there were the all three yeah. together. Um, I have actually, where is it, where is it? Oh, um, like can I find that? This is just a hand drawn on there, but based on the, um, no, these are actually from the Cal Fire. So these three fires uh, hit us right in a row um, last year. And it's important to uh, know that the Valley Fire is the only one that was considered a, a, I guess it was a presidential declared disaster. The other two were not. The, uh, the Valley Fire therefore had, uh, it, it meant that there were all, sort of, uh, uh, all of a sudden uh, federal agencies involved and federal resources involved like FEMA that weren't available for the Rocky Fire and Jerusalem Fire. And that was primarily because of the, the loss of <laughs> homes and infrastructure that was deemed at a much larger um, level than the Rocky Fire and Jerusalem Fire. Even though people did lose their homes and there was a ton of wild lands burned, um, the Valley Fire is really got the most focus in terms of assistance. And there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of built, you can see in, in Middletown, there's a lot going on to kind of build things back up. The fires themselves, though, um, you know, burned things, they burned structures, and there are creeks that run through the burned areas, and those creeks, some of those creeks lead to Clear Lake. Uh, we did, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, we did a um, monitoring plan based on, uh, you know, basically requesting the, the, uh, that the fires, uh, that we do some post-watershed monitoring. So I put together this, this table that shows, and, and it came from the uh, documents, that uh, the initial documents, engineering documents that were created right after the Valley Fire. And, it, and they list the creeks, they list the acreage in there. So I just put it in a table and, and put the watershed that it, that it ran into because they didn't have that info in there. So you can see that, that quite a few acres flow into Puda Creek, the upper Puda Creek watershed. And frankly, I mean, that was, uh, I believe, eight, 75 or between 70 and 80 percent of the fire runoff goes into, goes into Poudre Creek. Um, so we asked the state, we asked EPA, we asked the state, uh, FEMA, OES, various agencies and people, we want to sample, uh, do water sampling in six creeks, the six major receiving creeks that uh, where the Valley Fire uh, washed into, and in the control creek, just to compare. So a creek in the area that didn't get burned, just to compare. So what we asked for funding for was basically, it's a huge whopping figure of um, $47,000, huge whopping amount. Mm -hmm. I'm being sarcastic because millions of dollars has gone into Lake County to, to get it back going again. But we asked for $47,000 to be paid to a lab, not even to the tribe, to be paid to a lab to do water quality monitoring, watershed monitoring, because those contaminants, the burned contaminants, can cause cancer. The dioxins, burned plastic, create dioxins which cause cancer. And that's flowing into Clear Lake, and it's flowing into Upper Puda Creek, uh, into St. Helena Creek, it's flowing into Puda Creek, it's flowing into Lake Berryessa, it's flowing into the Russian River, and um, so we were actually not able to get any funding to do dioxin monitoring of water or sediment or fish because it does build up with fish as well. But we did get money to, or we, they basically paid for analysis for us to measure Kelsey Creek and Cole, um, Kelsey and uh, Forbes Creek 
which is the uh, Control Creek, and um, Puda Creek, and we, we did the uh, St. Helena as well. So let me show you the map of that. So Sarah, you didn't get any money for dioxin <coughs> so what were, what did you get money for monitoring? Um, so we, ha we had to go through a pretty serious kind of uh, negotiations with them. Um, let's see if that <coughs> Yeah, so here's the Puda Creek sampling site. And St. Helena is a control site, so it's outside of the, um, outside of the burn area. What, uh, and then this, is, this map is not showing uh, the other two sites that we're monitoring. Uh, what we got money to, or what they paid for for an analysis, and they asked for real specific uh, types of analysis that went to their uh, the Central Valley Regional Water Quality Control Board to their lab, their contracted lab. So, so what we monitored for were nutrients, because nutrients are what feed cyanobacteria and nuisance algae, and those nutrients are various forms of phosphorus and nitrogen. And then we also uh, met, uh, measured for uh, or sampled for um, metals, dissolved metals and, and metals. We, there's something called, um, oh, one of the things about the nutrients is that 300,000 gallons of fire retardant were sprayed on the Valley Fire. So there, it's 80% phosphate, it's called phoscheck. And so a lot of that went into Puda Creek. Now phosphorus is one of the foods of cyanobacteria or weeds. Let me see if I can actually get the list. So uh, we also looked at certain um, things like dissolved silica, which is a uh, part of the ash. And here's a, a lab result, actually, the most recent one. So we did three three sampling events um, for Kelsey and Forbes Creek, and we just got permission to start measuring PUDA, so it was right before, just right before everything kind of stopped raining. So we're, we're gonna be doing more monitoring come this fall, um, because the state will be paying for that. So, so we are in the initial stages of um, analyzing that data. Okay, so semi-volatile semi organic compounds. So a lot of them, if you look at the result, it's, I also put this on there just to talk about lab results a little bit. Uh, every lab reporting is different, but ND is non-detect. So, so the semi-volatile organic compounds, uh, for the most part, were non-detect in this particular site. This is Puda Creek. Um, there was nitrate and nitride levels, or nit nitrate, no nitrate. Uh, what we're going to do, this is part of the, you know, what is this mean phase? You have some numbers, it doesn't mean that it's the end of the world, okay? Because every creek is gonna have a certain amount of pollutants in it and that are naturally occurring or human caused. Every creek, because that's how we live on this land. So um, what we're comparing these numbers to, the results to, is what the water quality standards are, what it means to human health, and to animal health. Um, so that's, that's what we're in the midst of doing. All of this data we then enter into, um, into, a, into the water quality exchange, which is part of the central data exchange. So it's going to the feds, and it is already visible in their system. And how were the phosphate levels? Did you see an increase because of the terms? Um, well, in, so let's look at this. In, um, so this is this sampling event took place uh, in mid March. I think it was mid March. I'll get our chain of custody real quick. Sorry about this being back and forth. Okay, uh, March tenth. Okay, so if you look at So here's Puda Creek. So this is in the fire area, and matter of fact, it is Puda Creek flows. It it, it has, um, or I guess it's here. It is the receiver. By the time we get to that sampling site, a lot has come in. It's almost at the outside of the burn area. I'm really excited to get this site. It's actually a private, privately owned property, and they've allowed us to go on it, which is really nice. Um, so by the time you get to that, it's received a lot of uh, the the runoff of the, the entire fire. So back to the results. Um, and I, w 
wish I brought my spreadsheet. We, we put it into an Excel spreadsheet so it's really easy to sit there and look and compare right away. But uh, the, so here's a phosphorus level of 0.46, and that's in milligrams per liter, so it's parts per million. And it's bolded because it is a detect, right? So let's compare that to St. Helena, the St. Helena site, which is our control site. Um, I, there are some things that are way higher when you look at it. Um, so phosphorus, so that's phosphorus. Let's go to the St. Helena site. Um, let me just show you. So there are definitely metals in there. Um, aluminum, there's a lot of aluminum in the runoff is what we've noticed in the fire burn areas. So that's St. Helena. Okay, so phosphorus, no detect. So, um, so the Puda Creek had higher levels of phosphorus than the St. Helena Control Creek, which is outside of one area. The aluminum level here at St. Helena Creek was 2630. And the, the other thing you have to do is compare it to background levels. Is that a normal uh, thing to have, a normal level of aluminum? And it's not like your lab results tell you that. You have to do research after that. So aluminum, St. Helena Creek, and Puda Creek. 16,200. So there's definitely a lot more aluminum that is in the uh, burned uh, runoff than there is in the non burned area. So just that's just a few things I wanted to show you about um, the, the lab results. But what we're doing, and, and, and the Central Valley Regional Water Quality Control Board is very interested in this because it is really kind of a one of a kind from what we understand, um, and that's why they're supporting it. What they're also going to look at is what, are, what is the nutrient loading, again, the phosphorus and the nitrogen, what is the nutrient loading in the lake because uh, of, and Clear Lake, because, because Clear Lake has a nutrient TMDL, or total maximum daily load, so it has to do with being impaired, um, and that's part of the Clean Water Act um, requirements that you develop a loading level. And the, the TMDL is how much can you load the lake with that pollutant and still not have any problems or impairments with the lake. Uh, so they've come up with a level in, for nutrients, uh, for phosphorus, basically. So, but it, there is a requirement to monitor for phosphorus because the phosphorus is what's feeding the algae or the, or the cyanobacteria. So they want the phosphorus levels to be limited or a, you know, a total maximum daily load to, so that the lake will not have these algae blooms anymore. Cyanobacteria blooms. But it's part of the Clean Water Act. You do monitoring, you set uses for a water body. Oh, there's swim in, or the swim in, it's, it's used for drinking water, there's endangered species there. And then each of those categories has their own um, um, requirements of standards. So does a fish does it really matter to a fish what the E. coli level is in the lake? Probably not. But it does matter what the temperature is, it does matter what the oxygen level is, it does matter what um, the dissolved solids are because it could affect their gill. You know, there's there's things that that are um, pollutants that really affect fish that don't necessarily affect us and vice versa. So each of these, so as part of the Clean Water Act, you look at those things, and if there if you have a problem with a water body, you then back it up to who's causing the problem, and then you have to, you know, you have requirements that they have to do. This is why it's important to monitor. There's barely any monitoring on Clear Lake, and there's probably barely any monitoring in your water areas too. And that's because the government won't do it. They won't do it because there's no funding for it. There's no funding for it because there's Republicans in power. Yeah, there's just, there's just begun um, uh, voluntary water monitoring of groundwater in Napa Valley, and I think some in Sonoma County too, but it's voluntary. I don't think groundwater? it's groundwater. Okay. It's not required. Sarah, I'd just like to give you a heads up. You're yeah. at about an hour now. Okay. Will's not here, so I'd say go with it until he gets here. Okay, and I'm going to move to the next topic. I wanted to give you kind of snippets of things that we're working on. Um, let's talk a little bit about sampling. I um, want to ask quickly, yeah. Charlotte, for that uh, voluntary monitoring, is there a, could someone, is there an agency or I need a company go through that maybe people from here could use yeah, well it's a, it's a county it's part of the county agency or it's a it's a newly developed part of the county you know, you know about that the groundwater management yeah it's related to sigma the sustainable groundwater management act of 2014 yeah. and that's statewide so i think every every district or area and i'm not sure what
what all those areas are, will be required to have a plan if they're high or in priority. Yeah. And I'll talk about that in a second, too. Yeah. So that's right. it. Okay. Right. Um, okay, so here is, if you want to do sampling or monitoring, it's good, you know, here is an example of a local lab. It's called Alpha Labs or in Ukiah. And I just wanted to point out what, um, what that would look like if you were going to take samples of something. So there is a, a drinking water list. There is a this this is where this wastewater recycled water and stormwater program work is where all other waters info is. So creek water, lake water is under this because drinking water is chlorinated, right? It's got and it's for, there are real specific drinking water laws, right? To, for how safe it has to be. So if you click on that link, you get a list of. Let's see if I can make it bigger. Um, you, you can see that, probably not. Um, uh, I guess not. Okay, so, um, but let me, let me point it out. So, you basically, you decide what analysis you're going to ask for, and that analysis, it could be, I want to measure for glyphosate, you know. It tells you the test method, so those are, that's called um, standard method, and that's some numbers that are a part of it. So, so for total and fecal coliform, it's SN9221. You, the reason why it's important to get, the, to, to not pick the drinking water one when you're measuring for creek water, is because the drinking water uses a different method of analysis because it has chlorine in the water, so they have to do something different. But it lists the, the source method. The PQL basically is practical quantitative limit, and it, it says this is the, the level at which our instrument will measure to. So that's the lowest our level our, measure, our instrument will measure to. So in terms of uh, people call from it's two MPNs are most probable numbers. Let's say we had something where for cyanotoxins, which aren't on this list, by the way, we don't send to them. We send our samples to UC Davis. But the the um, if, if, if the you, you want a machine that will measure below what you're trying to see, you know. So if the level of the safe level has been set at one, you don't want a machine that measures to two. You want a machine that measures to like 0.5 or something like that, so you can catch that real low stuff. So it's really important when you're picking a lab to to look at what their machinery, uh, what their uh, lab equipment can measure too. So that's usually called PQL. This also can be called instrument detection level. Uh, you know, basically those two things. And then here's the bottles. So a 500 mil poly is about this big. It's like if you go to the store and get a lemonade that's this big. That's a that's a 500 mil or milliliters. Um, so some some water some samples require you to required to put it in amber glass. And, and that is because of the way that the contaminants could um, uh, in, interact with the with plastics. This is the bottle for glyphosate. This, yeah, that's a... Which I have not done yet. And it's from a lab in Santa Rosa. Yeah, and so and what are you planning on analyzing for? Glyphosate. Okay. Um, so, and then there's a column called preservation. So it's real nice to get on these lab sites and Alpha, I highly recommend Alpha, but if you're going to a different lab, you need to look at their stuff. It says if there's supposed to be a preservation in that bottle, and then um, to make sure that it doesn't break down right away. And then there's a hold time. So that's how many, that's how much time needs to pass between the time you take that sample and the time it gets to the lab for analysis. So with with bacteria, with like coliform, with E. coli <clears throat> and fecal coliform, it's eight hours. So if we're if we're out there in the afternoon taking a sample on a Friday, don't even bother taking a sample on a Friday afternoon or any afternoon if you have a really short hold time because it immediately has to get to the lab. You're going to be driving it over. The other day, you know, Elon sent someone over to drive to UC Davis to drop off an anabina. Um, um, water sample because the anatoxins break down so quickly. So we drove to UC Davis instead of waiting for it to be picked up the next morning and then analyze them, you know, that afternoon. Um, so, th so those are important and and they are they, you can find it on the web or you can ask the lab for it. And it's like I said, don't use mayonnaise jars or whatever. You actually want to get the right bottle with the right analysis. 
And if, what you do is, if you wanted to use Alpha Labs, you would call them and say, um, we wanna, we're going to plan on doing certain samples um, and we, that we want to submit to you. And then usually you have to set up an account. They will give you the bottles for free and then ship you the bottles or you can pick them up. And then you would follow their procedures and then uh, send it off to the lab. But those, you want to keep all those things in mind. I wanted to jump into um, water quantity issues. Let me just go. Have you all ever heard of E-RIMS? E-RIMS? Um, E-RIMS is where you find out who's, who's allowed to take what water where you live in terms of the creeks. So Google E-W-R-I-M-S, and half the time it doesn't work, it's highly irritating. <laughs> so, seriously, I think they did that on purpose. Um, so you go to the mapping application, <coughs> let's see if it works. Uh, and, and you look up your creek, and you zoom in and it tells you who has, who's, you can actually look to see what your neighbors or the people on that creek are, um, what, what kind of water they're using. And that's how we found out that the creeks where the Clear Lake Hitch run had millions upon millions of gallons being, being taken every year for agriculture. Uh, so we actually submitted that data to, um, to, okay, here we go, to the feds when it came to the federal listing. So there, the review for the, the fed, federal listing of the Clear Lake Hitch hasn't happened yet. But you know, we provided them with that data. There's a lot of water being taken from these creeks. And nobody's adding it all up to see if it's over adjudicated. Nobody is adding it up. And that's where we come in because we can go, hmm, you know, this creek goes dry from here to here, and there's this illegal marijuana production going on, this illegal marijuana production going on, this big vineyard going in, this big vineyard going in, and this is the knowledge is power thing again. You can go, wait a minute, it's already, it's already, um, Running dry, and be, and and because the the uh, by by stream, there we go. Uh, because the county does, or because the state doesn't add it all up or evaluate it at all, um, you can you can make that argument. Doesn't mean you're going to win anything, but you can make that argument, and it becomes part of a body of knowledge of we need to stop this, and the way we're going to stop it is through having detailed information, and we might have to go to the state to do it. Um, here is Adobe Creek, and so I, just, I, click, I put in Adobe Creek because that's one I'm familiar with. And basically, you put in any creek that you want, find water right by watershed or by stream, and then you can basically click on it, and uh, let, me, let me do, no, so it'll give you, it says this is a claimed water right by Cross Springs Vineyard. They are taking 25 acre feet a year. They're taking a lot more. Huh? They're taking a lot more. Are they really? Yeah. Well, that's interesting, I clicked on this one. Uh, okay, if they are, so here's an interesting thing. The state says the way that you can measure your usage is by, um, you. They give you various methods to to um, to be able to measure it. If they are taking more than that, then I would like some more details on that, um, maybe off camera. But but um, what you so what can you do? I think what you do it, there's a couple things, but is to go back to the state water resources control board and inform them that they are taking more than that, and they will probably. <laughs> The other thing is you can make, the way this is set up, you, could, you make your arguments to the fish and game wardens. If you're seeing issues happening, uh, creeks running dry or something, you call the fish and game wardens and, and let them know that, the, that there's being impacts on, on the creeks. I find it doesn't work very well though, but that's... It doesn't, yeah, so we've yeah. done that. We've, we've done exactly what you've suggested. Mm -hmm. we, we went the fish and game route and the uh, state water resources control board route for, because Shannon dammed up a creek, and so that's fish and game. That's, yeah. you can't do that. And then also the, the water wastage, and that's state water resource control. And, uh, and none of, basically that what they do, it ends up on the desk of someone uh, who, who this becomes work for. 
Uh-huh. And so no one wants work. So do they so have a stream bed alteration permit? No, of course not. They don't, and so and they have a dam in there. Yeah, and and so we um, we had a hydrogeologist come out and point this out to us. Did you know that there's uh-huh. a that there is a dam? And and we wouldn't know. And so there were there were several sort of offenses of water law that we went after and, and informed the state about. And and we were quite hopeful because at the county level nothing ever happens. We were quite hopeful that at the state level something might happen, uh, and it did not. So that just basically it ends up on someone's desk. They send a letter and and and, and he's allowed to respond to that. And when what he does is he tells them a lie, and, and that's the end of that, because no one wants work on their desk. Um, that can be. Uh, um, I don't know why it ended that way. Um, we had to do something similar to uh, for Debbie Creek downstream, and it took three years, but we got it, got that diversion taken care of. Uh, I was gonna. If you you don't even have to like go to that site anymore. Google Earth is our friend. Yes. And right you can take pictures of it and yep. send it off. I would like to get more, especially since you're talking about Adobe Creek, and we're uh, we're involved in a large project right right now where we're looking at all the wells that are along the Adobe Creek and wells that are within the riparian zone of the creek. If they're affecting the surface water flow, are supposed to have a stream bed alteration permit from Fish and Wildlife. No creeks, no wells on the creeks of Adobe or Kelsey have stream bed alteration permits. Therefore, they're potentially operating uh, not in compliance with the Fish and Game mm-hmm. Code. Mm-hmm. And we are about to send them a list of about 250 wells along these creeks, yes, that with mapped and everything, we got the wells. If you, if you haven't done this yet, you can get all the wells in the area through the Department of Water Resources. They have well completion reports that are now allowed, that are now out there at the, uh, available to the public. So, and it'll hopefully show you exactly where that well is. But that, and you can do what we're doing and see if it's got a stream bed alteration permit and if it's very close to a creek, it's supposed to. But none of them do. Because this is how small towns operated, you know, in the previous years. And how close do they have to be? Within the riparian zone. So if you see, if you go on Google Earth and you see where the vegetation is, if they've removed it all because they're a vineyard and that's how they like to do, then um, it's, I, I would at least guesstimate 100 feet back or so. The main point though is it has to be proven to affect the surface water flow. And when I asked about the evaluation of how they evaluate that, I'm getting barely any information from Fish and Game about this, but um, they will evaluate the flow. They will evaluate the flow somehow. I'm trying to get more info on that. But if you provide them with, there's this well, this well, this well, none of them have stream bed alteration permits. This is impacting the surface water flow. Please evaluate them. Um, and I'm happy to help with trying to find these things. After, you know, just let me know and we can start talking. But uh, you, it, it is a piece of, you know, it's a tool now that we can all use. We can get these well completion reports from the Department of Water Resources and start to see, um, see get them evaluated for surface water flow. Sir, can I make just a really brief point? Mm-hmm. Is that that surface water is, it belongs to the people of the state of California. It belongs to you. It's held in trust by the state. This is a public trust resource. And the, and the uh, family I grew up in, you know, I was taught at a real young age by my father, who was quite a water warrior. That that neighbor of yours is stealing from you. Oh, yeah. It's akin to going to the bank and stealing. So I think we need to remember that water belongs to all of us. So anytime you see a dam, whether it's private, public, or municipal, that it is required by Fish and Game, uh, Fish and Game Code 5937 to release, to keep uh, fish below the dam in good, good condition throughout the year. So that's the other problem. Not only is he stealing water, he's damaging water resources for fisheries. Okay, look it off my podium. Well, you're right, it, but the onus, is on the, it, the onus is on the public and on the downstream users to yes. prove the impact. With, with riparian rights, basically, if you, if you live on a, on a creek, um, 
you have riparian rights, which is basically you can't store it for more than 29 days, and um, you can't ship it off your property, but you can use it for beneficial use. So you can use it for your agriculture, you can use it for domestic use, watering, or whatever you want to do. But um, and you can't dewater. You've got to, you know, you can't take all the water. No, well, yeah. you can use it to beneficial use. Mm -hmm. Now, if the downstream users or environmentalists or anybody else says there's not enough water for the fish to spawn, mm -hmm. like we do, like we say, or you know, we can't even. There's no water for us to do our thing. You actually, from what I understand, have to take them to court. Yeah. That's you can't just yeah. report it for riparian use. You have to, you, the onus is on you to prove that it hasn't happened, or that, that you can't, that your beneficial uses can't be met. She's right. And yeah. as far as the Department of Fish and Game, they're useless. They're, they're futile. They need dead and dying fish or wildlife. Then they'll get involved. Not so if you barely. see that, take no photos barely. because those could be there one day and gone the next. But that's what they need are dead bodies. And then you may get some action out of them. Otherwise, it's futile. And yeah. that's where we share the resource sometimes of lawyers who will work either pro bono or what is it called when they get paid at the end because they know they're going to yeah. 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 Actually, we, we evaluate, we, um, I hope this will show it. Um, I, I asked the um, local department, uh, district attorney's office, yes I did, I, I asked the local district attorney's office for all of the um, cases that were against the Fish and Game Code um, over like a five year period or something, okay? So they gave me some of this info and then I put the rest in. Um, so out of 37 cases that went to the local DA since 2000 and, what was that? 2009, 37 cases went, and this is all Fish and Game Code violations. Five of them, according to their own data, um, Five of them had a correction made. So this is so. What happens is you report it to Fish and Game Wardens. They write up the report and they do a citation. It goes to the DA's office, which is a terrible system because the local DA has to get elected. Yeah. So he's not doing anything. Um, so five. So out of 37 cases from 2009 to 2000. Uh, 14 is when I asked about this. Yeah. Nine corrections made, or five had corrections made. Okay, that's it. Five out of 37. Nine were dismissed, 13 were rejected, and 10 are pending. And some of these pendings are for since, um, the pendings are blue, since, you know, to, uh, I guess the oldest is 2012. So Fish and Game, oh, and here's a percentage. Yeah, 13, 13%, 13.5% actually had corrections made, and the rest were rejected or still pending. And, and that's because, um, I think it's because of politics. It I think it's politics. a bad law. I agree. Yeah. Now, does Adobe Creek, um, does it contain listed or in, oh, good. Okay. Well, that's in your favor. It is. Okay. So the, so the Clear Lake Hitch run in Adobe Creek and take is illegal. But how do you prove that vineyards and other activities, land use activities, are actually creating take, which is basically killing or, or harming them or damaging them? So we're accumulating a body of knowledge which shows that the low water levels are partially because of the water rights not being evaluated, because of all these wells that are in that nobody has you know, added up all the, um, or, or done any sort of uh, environmental evaluation on their impact on the surface flow, and that type of thing. Because basically right now it looks like the only people who are taking the hitch are the Palmo Indians, you know, because of their culture. And that's the only, because you can see them going, I want to have a fish for my ceremony. So, but everybody else's take, everybody else's use of the water, which means that there's not enough for them to spawn up in there and for the young six weeks later to come back into the lake, the fish are dying in, in puddles, in, 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 in pools, in, the, in creeks. So looking at water and watching water is extremely important and we have these tools now to, and I couldn't find it, but on the eRIM site, you can actually look at everybody's statement of diversion and use reports and you can see what they're reporting, how much water they're using, um, how they're measuring their use of the water, that type of thing. Um, so I guess uh, the last thing I wanna um, bring up is groundwater and this is, um, my, uh, I'm really in the midst of learning about this, but as you mentioned, there are there are two 
uh, basins in Lake County that have uh, that are considered medium priority basins, and that is the Big Valley Basin and the Scotts Valley Basin. And the, and the, the state uh, enacted the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, which requires that any of the medium or high priority basins have to develop groundwater sustainability plans. And these are going to be developed by groundwater sustainability agencies. So who's on the agencies, right? Who's on the groundwater sustainability agencies? Well, there hasn't been one developed for, for Lake County yet for the two basins, but it's political. So you have to fight to get in. And I've been to meetings before where the, GF, where, where the movers and shakers of the water district say, be careful who you let on your GSAs. So, and it's because it's all about sustainability. Sustainability <laughs> is a word that's thrown around a lot, but it does mean what the state of uh, the Department of Water Resources is saying is if you're not showing that you're, you can maintain this, this level of, of uh, aquifer, that meets the beneficial uses of all the needs that are in the area, then you're not being sustainable. So it's important to look at your particular basin and um, and if your basin was not is not listed, so all these other basins in Clear Lake and Lake County that aren't listed as medium priority, you can put pressure on the county to incorporate all of the basins into a sustainable groundwater management planning. Yes. When do these plans go into effect? I think it's so the GSAs have to be developed by 2017. So the groundwater sustainability agencies have to be developed by 2017. The groundwater sustainability plans have to be adopted um, and finalized by 2022. So, yeah. so we have uh, we've gone that route. Also, we we've tried to um, point out to the state that our basin should probably be. Um, not a very low priority basin, which it currently is, but rather a medium priority basin because it's distressed. And that doesn't work either because of the fact that the information that forms the basis for an assessment or a reassessment for which you can apply, which, which takes uh, at least two years to even, to even be looked at. And, but the basis for, um, for these assessments is how much uh, agricultural land is in use overlying the basin. Yeah. In our particular case, the state is, is using data from the 1970s that shows that there's 50 acres of, of agricultural land. Now, Shannon has over a thousand acres of vineyards on top of that that they're simply not aware of. Right. And, 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 and it's so basically, if you're trying to get a basin reassigned uh, based on these old, outdated data, in the, forget about it. But you have to start. True. You have to start. True. Now, aren't there county monitoring wells that are in the um, in that basin? What basin are you in? Uh, we are in the uh, <coughs> high, we're in the High Valley Basin, and there uh, and there isn't one. There isn't. There aren't any county. Um, um, okay, we can go high yeah, what about basins that there's just no information? Well, here's the thing. So there's a system called CASGEM that the, the there there are monitoring wells within Lake County, um, and you can find them, and you can find them in, for all the counties, but I apologize for those of you who are out of county. Uh, Lake County, California, groundwater. Okay, let me just find, um, so on the groundwater management section of Lake County, groundwater data. So um, the county does have a groundwater management plan, such as it is, and they do show their wells. Um, and that would be, okay, would be the easiest way to do it. So, the, so that data has been reported to CASGEN. So here's High Valley. So High Valley has uh, monitoring wells. And that data has been reported to the state for years, for years. And what they've done is um, they, to determine these, these basins of medium or high priority, they look at the data of the existing wells and they, they, just like you said, Greg, they, they look at how much agricultural land is there, how many people live on there, yeah. and then they make a determination. Uh, it's a formula. Right. And actually, and I want to show you that formula on this page, on, on the Department of Water Resources page, but yeah. I can't well, find yeah. it. Find well, it. And we have very few people living there, so for us, it's a... It's yeah, a, so this formula is, is what they determine is the way that they're going to prioritize basins. But you can see right here in High Valley, 
There are um, four wells, and it shows the uh, spring average um, level and the fall average, and then also the spring 20, or 2016 level. So, um, and, and that's an average going back, I think they say um, 40 or 50 years or something like that. Um, and how do I interpret those data? Huh? How do you interpret those data? How do you interpret it? Yeah. Well, like what do those numbers mean to you? So that, those are, that's the, um, that is the static well level. So that's saying, that right there is the elevation of the groundwater table. So, and there are hydrographs. So what DWR does is they look at, so, and the page I just came from said they've been collecting data, uh, groundwater data in Lake County since the 40s. So um, when they say average, this is based on how far back they go. Where is the High Valley Basin? I apologize, I just stepped in. Let me see if I can. Is that off the of High Valley Road? On but it, it didn't look like the current levels were much off the averages to me. No, they're not. And that's what it's finding. So fortunately, they're also looking. I, I'm glad that, that the state is not choosing medium or high priority basin um, prioritization just on static well levels. And they should also be looking at the other uses on the land, the people that live there and the ag that's there, because um, the, that shows that there's an ongoing demand. Um, but what you're, so in, in the state, in the DWR site, uh, and I'm sorry, I can't really show you, you're just gonna have to find it. Um, where is it? Jeez, okay. Uh, oh, so here is uh, some detail about the, uh, High Valley Basin, and what you're saying is true that they will sometimes use this old data and old calculations, and that's where we you just have to start. It might take three years, but continue to show them data and and you know record that people's wells are going dry. And I would work within the Department of Water Resources. As a matter of fact, there is a um, there is a, there are a couple of really um, sympathetic staff at DWR. I'd be happy to pass on. Uh, the names of people I know. Please. Yeah, because those are the ones that help you get in. Um, One so of them actually contacted me. <laughs> really? Yeah, that's good. So. Um, there is there's another great thing, and I just can't find it. But you, for each of these basins, you can uh, the somewhere on the DWR site, the Department of Water Resources, uh, the state level, where you can see how they came up with that calculation for each basin. I just can't put my hands on it now. So that's a little bit about groundwater. I know in Lake County, um, most of the basins are not medium or high priority, which means that, you know, business as usual. And when you go through the CEQA process, and I, and I know this is familiar with this, you have to, um, you have to show, they're basically evaluating the vineyard going in based on the, on the impacts that it's supposed to have on these different resources groundwater being one of them. I find that they don't do their homework, they don't, this, the county doesn't do due diligence to and in the way that they evaluate. And this is why knowledge is power, because you can start to show, you know, you can provide them with information, but sometimes you have to sue them. Sometimes you have to sue them. You know, we, I've been part of a group that sued the county before and we lost it, unfortunately. It's a rattlesnake island um, issue. But, uh, I think we need to change the political climate and have uh, people of our nature in politics because we will we can then change the laws and make CEQA stronger, stop these problems that we're having that businesses and other land users are getting away with. Because we know it's of course because continue to collect data, continue to formulate monitoring plans and action plans because uh, we're gonna get there. I know we will. We're already changing some things. So I guess, I don't know. I, those are the topics I want to cover. Okay.